Here are some home videos taken by my husband, John. The small details of life to treasure forever. Lately, I've been asking the big question. What does it mean to be a good mother? The fear of not ever being able to do enough, well enough, has been handed down to me in many ways, including a long heritage of expert advice to mothers. But what about Tommy? He still hasn't eaten his lunch. Mrs. Smith is at her wit's end. He must eat. She scolds, coaxes and bribes, but still he does no more than pick at his food. Mother may be able to spank him and put him to bed, but she can't make him eat. Well, I don't think there's much the matter with you, my little man. I tried hard to find something wrong with you, but couldn't. Now you just run in that waiting room and play with those toys and have a little fun while I have a worry with your mother. Mrs. Smith, you are the problem, not the boy. You are the problem. You are the problem. You are the problem. Today's child raising experts also seem to know exactly what to do at all times. I study the renowned Dr. Penelope Leach and resolve to be more patient, understanding, and resourceful. However many tantrums your child has right now, his own development is on your side. As he grows physically, intellectually, and emotionally, the world will become less frustrating, and he'll feel more and more able to manage himself, rather than being at the mercy of people who manage him. In the meantime, though, do remember that while tantrums aren't tragedies and should be taken in your stride, they're not at all useful for either of you, so they're best avoided whenever you can. In spite of the parenting tips, my confusion lingers. I decide to talk to my mother. How did you do it all? Did you think that anybody else could do any of the work that you did? No, I didn't think about it. Because life, I thought that life, this is life, and I thought this is the best I could do. So, um, so I didn't think about other things that it's, that it's uh, available even. Did daddy help you? In those days, the men didn't help. They went to work, and of course, and, and they came from work, and how much he could, he helped me a little bit, but not much. But the only thing what I thought about is of my family. I had a very stylish beginning. My parents, my sister and I lived above the barber shop where my father worked. My father is giving Yasmin and Simon his special blunt cut, exactly like the one I used to wear. This is the best customer. This is my best customer. And Dolly's look Dolly. how long. Yes. My mother is a tower of strength and courage, even though she's only four foot nine. But as a child, I couldn't see her as clearly as I do now. Immigrant and seamstress, she was so unlike the mothers I saw on television, or the Canadian-born women of my neighborhood. When I was Simone's age, I remember making wishes in the mirror. That I would not be fat, that my mother would not be an immigrant, and that my mother would be tall. If only she was more like the perfect mothers I dreamed of, then I would fit in too. She was busy, overworked, and worried about money, problems that television mothers never seem to have. There was much to learn about real and imaginary mothers, and I knew I could not do it alone. I attended a workshop sponsored by Mothers Are Women, a support and political action group of mothers who choose to stay home. Okay. Helen Levine, counselor and activist, spoke on the subject of guilt, anger, and motherhood.
I think we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> and a lot to say. And we don't have that many opportunities. There's a whole mysti mystique around what a good mother and a good woman ought to be. But there is a paltry amount of um, actual social recognition or status or prestige given in this culture at least to mothering, to the role, to the role of giving nurturance to a child, to taking the time to do it well, to all the things that we're expected to do otherwise we feel guilty. If we do it well, nobody gives a shit. If we do it badly, we get a lot of punishment. The young woman behind the cash asked me if I had a work number and I said no and she scrawled doesn't work across the back of my check. And I can remember she didn't say anything, but I physically felt like I had been kicked in the gut. And I looked at my children that were, oh, 23 months old and uh, one that was three months old, and I did the appropriate thing and I smiled at her and said, thank you, <laughs> and sort of stumbled out of the store. And I realized now that what I should have done was enlightened her. You're afraid of opening a Pandora's box? It's like, am I going to start something here that I wasn't prepared to get into? I mean, you can deal with your daily anger and, you know, you're mad at this, or you're mad at that. But if you start getting at the root cause of your anger, are you, are you prepared to sort of follow through on it? Because you can't open it and then shut it because then it never gets dealt with. These are all later. Private and Confidential, Halifax, 1980. Diary, number one. Helen had thought a lot about the mystique of motherhood, what a good mother ought to be. Looking through her diaries, she recalled raising two daughters in the 1950s, the new era of the nuclear family. My experience of motherhood, actually, during those first years was very rich. I was really into the romance of motherhood. And it lasted for a while. I guess I just thought those kids were uh, very, very special and, and that I was very special as a mother. And even though not everything was going right, I remember my older daughter sucked her thumb and I was really worried about that. What was it I was doing wrong? And my younger one never slept and needed a pacifier and bottles endlessly. But it was kind of a challenge. Like, I was going to do it differently. I was going to do it better. And I was going to make, make it so that my kids grew up to be strong and healthy and happy and all those, all those things. I hoped I would be a wife and mother, but I worried that maybe nobody would ask me to be a wife, and I presumed that there was no other way of being a mother than being a wife. I just took that for granted as the whole meaning of my life. He would be the breadwinner, and I would be the mother who stayed at home full time and that we would do what everybody else was doing as husband and wife and parents. Having children meant certainly that I became economically dependent on Gil. Uh, it meant that I was contained at home in a relatively isolated kind of way more and more losing my hopes and dreams for myself and my sense of being a separate person in that family and my sort of even thinking about how I would like to be in the world, that was just not, that was just not within my frame of reference. We looked at it, it was like a TV show and that's what it was. It didn't relate to us because it was really all about white. It was white families and we were not white. I, we weren't a white family. So it was just a different way of living. It didn't have nothing to do with us. We didn't see ourselves that way. We were totally different. 
when I went to school and the young girl said her mother stayed home. And I said, your mother stays home? What does your mother do? And she said, well, my mother cooks and cleans and takes care of the family. I said, but so does my mother. But my mother works. And what did you think of when you saw those women who stayed at home? To be honest, I thought they didn't know anything. I thought all they knew was like to cook and clean and I didn't like that too much. And that I, I felt that their minds got stagnated sitting there like that. And that they couldn't carry on a conversation. I believe that you should carry on a conversation with other people and that you had to know something about the world. I come from a family of nine children, three boys and six girls. We moved around when I was younger for jobs, I guess. And we can only live in certain areas anyhow. I'm of mixed parentage, and if you had a mixed marriage, well, you live certain areas. You just didn't live wherever you wanted to. And then, of course, I guess also part of it would have been finances. My mother worked two jobs. My mother used to work in a factory during the day, and at night she used to clean the clubs. My father was a military man and then a laborer. The school was hard. When I was young, they sat blacks at the back of the class. And they really didn't pay no mind to you. They really didn't pay no mind to you. They thought you were stupid. There were a lot of racist materials in the school at that time. I was too young to protest. But when my mother saw that we were performing shortening bread, she was furious and pulled me off the stage. It really didn't affect me in a way because I always felt good about myself and who I was. My mother always made me feel good about who I was and where I come from. I ended school in grade seven. I was 13. I folded and pressed shirts. Well, I always thought I would get married because that was the thing that was there. And plus children, and that was what was, you were told at that time that that's what you would do anyhow. It was expected. I had them when I was young. I think I had Tracy lasted 22 or 21, somewhere up in there. And I, I just went to work. My mother mined them and bore my sister. And then I went to work at night and was home during the day. That's when I changed to going into work in nightclubs. I wanted a better life for them than what I had. If anything went wrong in the marriage or something wasn't working, it was my fault. And I must be doing something wrong. And then I was to go home and correct it. Sometimes you didn't know what the heck it was you were supposed to correct, but you were supposed to correct something. I would try to uh, <clears throat> not be so argumentative, um, to sort of listen to his opinions and sort of agree with them. And of course, it would last a certain while, and then I'd be right back on the train. That is, I disagreed. And um, I went home a couple of times, and my father would say that, uh, you go back. I say, oh, no, I got to give this up. And he'd say, no, you go back. There's something wrong. You're doing something wrong. Mind you, they can never tell you what you were doing wrong, though. That was the other, that was the sad part. My mother would say, know? leave. <laughs> My mother said, uh, sex is for marriage and you don't do it until you're married. That was pretty much the extent of our conversation. My father didn't mention it. And it wasn't discussed amongst kids at school. Uh, girls who talked about it or thought about it were looked upon as, uh, as bad girls. And uh, the rest did it uh, in silence. Uh, and, and that was sort of tacitly acceptable, sort of. I got into this relationship when I was 14, at the end of grade nine, and uh, we went steady for, for two years, and, and then when I became pregnant, we, we got married. My expectations were that I would uh, um, get married and have children and, uh, uh, you know, live in a little house with that damn white picket fence, and uh, that, that was pretty much it for uh, a girl in the 50s. I believed that it would be the ultimate fulfillment, uh, that uh, I would always be there for my children and we would always adore each other, and that there would be uh, no negative features to, to life. 
Well, at the beginning, I was able to perpetuate this myth to some extent. And then there was the baby who was adorable. He was a, a very easy baby, very cuddly, and uh, no problems with the baby So at that time. From the time John was about three or slightly before three, he was extremely hyperactive and slept very little. And because he was also developmentally delayed and very frantic, he was very dangerous to himself. He tried to escape. It's a typically autistic sort of behavior, this need to escape and to run constantly. He could find ways outdoors and out windows. And most of my life at that time consisted of containing John to keep John alive. There was very little quality involved. It was just basic, basic, basic needs. There were no services provided by the community. Um, my mother and mother-in-law did a lot of, uh, a lot of sitting. Uh, so they were the, the sole uh, child care support. And what about your husband? No, he didn't. He didn't. Occasionally in the evening, he'd, uh, he'd stay home while I went out. How long was John at home then? He was at home for seven years until shortly before um, the birth of David, who's our third child. Nancy was able to sleep only three or four hours per day. After years of struggling without medical or social services, she had to accept the only alternative available, a long-term residential institution. It was horrible. It was a 19th century medical model institution. There were a lot of beds in one room uh, and people dressed in white without any real um, training in teaching handicapped children to be more independent. Actually, they were divided into, into three categories in those days. There was educable, and there was trainable, and there was, you know. And where was John? John was, we did bring him home to visit uh, about once a month, maybe. But uh, the tendency for my ex-husband was to bring him home, drop him off, and go out to play. So, uh, you know, I had like a baby in John and, and Jim, and uh, it, was, it was too difficult. So I, I finally said, uh, either you stay home and, and help with John or don't bring him home. And uh, he came home much less often after that. Helen studied social work at university and worked in the field until the birth of her first child. Her studies focused on child development. And that was no advantage. That was a tremendous disadvantage, I think, because the theories of the time were Freudian theories and uh, a lot of male authors, who of course were considered the experts, um, who were writing about maternal deprivation and how mothers were the key to the happiness of children and husbands and families and the world. And, and uh, it felt like a tremendous responsibility, as though, you know, on my shoulders and the shoulders of the mothers of the world sort of were all these key questions. We've suspected for a long time that these early attachments are fundamental to a person's emotional life. If something goes wrong early on, it's apt to stay wrong. We know much about the right conditions for children to grow up with healthy bodies. It may be we're entering an age when we shall know just as much about those that make for healthy minds. And I assumed, as most other mothers did, that the children were a blank slate and that whatever worked out well was to my credit and whatever didn't work out so well was uh, re a reflection of my inadequacies as a mother. Parents are showing great concern for that stage when the human mind is first developing in childhood. They seek advice from competent authorities, like Dr. Blutz of the Institute of Child Study, University of Toronto. 
understand, Mrs. Madge, that uh, this is your first child and that the both of you are worried about him. Yes, Dr. Blotz, we're afraid we have a problem child. There's no such thing as a problem child, Mrs. Madge. There are problems of child raising. Children are not born uh, delinquents nor uh, geniuses. They're made that way. We train them. And he seems to be so highly strung that uh, we're afraid he's on the verge of a nervous breakdown. We know that uh, there are certain things in childhood that will make for a nervous breakdown later on. One of them is if parents disagree. Children are very sensitive to the relations between their parents. Another thing is nagging. And I'm afraid mothers nag more than fathers, Mrs. Madge. Nagging, I think, is the worst crime on the parental calendar. So there was this sort of mix of feeling very important and on the other hand, a lot of feelings of inadequacy and confusion and, and not really understanding a lot about where it came from, but thinking, it must be me. Roddy's mother is happy to have him in nursery school, mainly because he is an only child. She's glad he's having fun and learning to get along well with other children. However, in a tea party situation, she gets pretty discouraged. The small graces of life, such as saying hello to Granny, are extra frills to the four-year-old. At this age, manners never can be counted on. Already, Mother senses the disapproval of Granny and Aunt Elizabeth. It's only a matter of minutes before another crisis. Granny thinks he should be old enough not to hog everything. Mother is beginning to wonder if she is bringing him up the wrong way. I didn't blame myself uh, because, the, uh, because of the baby. Uh, his, his development was so very different. And uh, he was actually receiving a lot less mothering than John was at that time. And your husband's? What was his sense of things? Um, he, he thought uh, my mothering had something to do with it, or at least that's what he expressed. I think, you know, this was, he didn't want to deal with it either, and it was easier for him to deal with that. And what happened with David? When did you suspect there might be something he, need, he would also need special um, help? Well, similar, similar to John, uh, when he stopped sleeping and became very hyperactive, it was very clear that uh, there was some kind of, Problem. Although David's development was was a bit different from John's. At what age was uh, David institutionalized? He was also seven. David, like his brother John, was diagnosed as autistic. Slowly recovering from chronic fatigue, Nancy left her marriage and continued the full-time mothering of Ken and Jim, her other sons. Life was supposed to be a certain way, and mothers were supposed to take care of everything, and uh, therefore there could be no, no problems that mothers couldn't deal with. Uh, handicapped children really uh, in interfered with that myth in a very significant way. What was the connection between the roles assigned to women in the 1950s and the theories of the day? I asked Helen, I don't think theories like that are ever an accident. Men were coming back from the Second World War. Women, meanwhile, had been living very independent lives and proving yet again that we can do anything. Take over the farms, take over the factories. Work in every possible way that men do. And the men came back and didn't have quiet, docile, agreeable partners who were thinking about men and children all the time. And it was very interesting, if you look at the posters during World War II, all the posters were encouraging women out of the home to put their children in day nurseries so that they could get out to the factories and the farms and replace the men. 
Following World War II, those posters changed. The land they returned to was a land where men could make their way and where women could be women once again. The return of the nylon stocking shook the nation. One by one, wartime controls and restrictions were lifted. And to one long squeal of delight, the good old days were back, and they were better than ever. The message was that you were the handmaiden of the family, and that you were there to live vicariously through other people, through your husband, through your children, and that that was the good life for women, and that normal women, healthy women, would certainly find that very rewarding as a lifetime project. Separated from her husband at the age of 26, with three small children in tow and unemployed, Florence was forced to go on welfare in the early 1960s. I went with Florence to revisit her old welfare office. You sort of hide. You know, you always walk with your head down because you're not supposed to be there. Or you should maybe go back to your situation because that's really where... I mean, even when I went to courts, that's what they used to tell me. Why don't you go back to your husband? I used to say no. I had called because I didn't receive my check. And at the time, I needed food. Some woman answered here, and she told me that it wasn't her problem. I had to go to the other branch, and I called the other branch. They said it wasn't their problem. So I called back here, and uh, I spoke to this lady again, and she said to me, uh, well, I'm sorry, you have to wait. And I said, well, how, do my, how will my kids eat in the meantime? She told me it wasn't her problem. I never, I, I don't believe I was so angry in all my life. I came, I told her to hang on to the phone and I came over here. I ran up the street to here because I just lived down the street. And I came up through here upstairs to the second floor. And I was looking for the woman with the telephone in her ear. And I remember on, when I spotted it, because I looked around when I spotted it, I unlocked the door and I went through. And I remember I grabbed up by her chest. And I said, I'm the lady from the other end of the line. And I remember she looked at me, and then there was people all over me. The police came. I mean, it was awful. You know, when you, you get into a situation where you let everything go and you say, well, the heck with it all, it's either this. You get fighting mad, and that's what I was at that time. I was angry, I was upset, and they said, the heck with everything. But there was a lady who came over and said, let me talk to you. I wasn't in the mood to talk to anybody because I was too upset. And now I felt very shamed because now everything was in the open. But it ended all right because that's when I joined SLAP. The same time was the Saint Laurent anti-poverty movement. And that sort of put me on the road to make things different. I had to do something. And I knew I couldn't live on one salary at that time because I didn't have a... I was a factory worker, now I had three kids and there was rent and things. Which, but what I did was I went and applied for a job. As a matter of fact, Davis Inc. And I remember when I walked in, they weren't hiring and I said, if you hire me, I'll work for two weeks. And if I'm not good after two weeks, you don't have to pay me. And if I'm good, then you hire me. And they agreed. And then I got a job at night. So I used to jockey from Saint Laurent and De L'Eglise down to Dorchester and Guy and I had half an hour to do it. And then I would work from five to two. And I did that four days a week. I was a waitress on the floor. I was not home a lot. And at a certain point, they actually really took care of themselves. I mean, I would telephone. I was always on the phone to make sure everything was running smooth in the house. But the oldest one really did a lot. He was 12, 13. He did a lot of babysitting for me. But they were okay, they would follow rules. Every now and then I'd have to jump in my car and go home, but my bosses understood that. But there was times when I did lose control and there was times when I would yell at the kids. Sometimes I didn't listen to them when they had something to say. And sometimes I'd have to go regroup and really think about what they said to me and come back out and apologize. 
and say, okay, I'll listen to you now. A lot of times I did that. What kept you going to work so hard? My children. My children to give, uh, to give them a better future and see that they get off on the right start. Plus, I think it was also something in me that was just not giving up. Hey, I'm going to come out of this and the best way I know how. So I think part of it is me too. I cleaned the house, I washed the diapers, I sewed dresses for my children, and I did everything. And, and this was the, the main thing in my life, to, to have everything perfect. You also washed walls. I did, because I wanted to, even the house, what I lived, it was a precious thing to have. And I'm lucky to have the children what I have. I didn't have any education, but I think I gave them as much as possible to have education. I saw a movement I liked very much. I liked the openness and the uh, sort of aggressive advocacy. I really identified very strongly with that. And in fact, when I began university, I met a lot of women who were recently divorced, had small children, and who had done as I had married early and did not have uh, job training at the time that they were married. Okay, Dave. Let's get up. Let's go. Let's go to the kitchen and get breakfast. Very nice. For the last several years, Nancy has cared for 27-year-old David. He had lived in institutions for 15 years. Here, Dave. Your pills. During that time, Nancy lobbied, held endless meetings, and joined committees to urge and pressure the institution into providing better quality care. Cool it off. Unable to affect real change or find a good group home in the community, Nancy brought David home. And blow on it a little bit. Okay, slow down, Dave, slow down. A blow on it. No, too impatient. Have a drink of water now, Dave. David goes to daycare five days a week allowing Nancy some time to finish her degree in art therapy. Davy, you big goof. It's the middle of the morning. We're getting all ready to go and see Sandy. You practically had your shoes on. <laughs> it's not dead time. It's getting up time. It's going out time. Nancy also works as a volunteer activist with a group of women friends. They fight for the rights of handicapped children and their caregivers. That's okay, Dave. Just stay like that for a minute. One of the things that I learned early about Dave also is that his skull does not move in the right direction. His something wrong with his bones. Um, he's uh, suffered a number of traumas to his head, and he's also suffered uh, tremendous trauma to his chest because when he was in the institution, he was restrained. Uh, he was placed in a bag, and wrestled to the floor, forced into a bag, and straps were placed over his chest. So it's been very, um, it's been a great deal of pressure on his chest. How often did that happen? Um, well, it varied. Uh, it was uh, usually once a week at least. So there are a number of things that need fixing in day. I don't know, doctor. I just can't seem to get through anything anymore. Things pile up, you know, just the dishes and the meals and the kids' clothes. There never seems to be any end. And I'm so tired all the time. I said she should get the doctor to give her a tonic or vitamins or something, but he 
He told us to come here. Mrs. Bowen, how long did you say you felt this way? About a year? I, I really don't know. I can't seem to remember. I think it was about a year ago. Just a little while after your mother came to stay. Well, that's all the material we need for now. Mrs. Bowen, I'm going to recommend that you be admitted here as a patient in our day hospital. Instead of having lives of our own and using our talents and having a place in the world with, with work, paid work, that we were all running to therapy, sort of sitting and talking about what our lives were like. The myths of motherhood were playing out quite differently than I had planned. The kids were becoming rebellious. Gil was very busy with the labor movement, traveling a lot. And I had been working part-time, but because I had never really faced up to investing myself in my own work and in looking for things that were important to me in my own work, I was kind of still on the margins there, too. And gradually just sank into despair. The assumption was that I needed to go to a psychiatric hospital and get psychiatric care. It just felt like my whole existence was smashed. I sort of, there were two parts of me, like one part of me was a total hopeless, vulnerable mess, and the other part of me was looking on at this crazy institution with all these men in charge and all these women, you know, who lived in the most horrifying situations that we all began to share and talk about. Um, but I for sure didn't want to be one of those mad women, you know? I had wanted to have a different kind of life. So, it was only afterwards that I began to appreciate how much I had learned from that experience and how much it had smashed, absolutely smashed, any notions of being different from other women. Any notions of being anything but ordinary in this world, and extraordinary, as all of us are, you know? But, I mean, there was no way that I could go back to what I was. I knew that. I couldn't be the handmaiden. I couldn't be the assistant, because all the women had been the assistants politically, too. I mean, it all sounds great, you know, we were hot left-wingers and activists, but it was the guys who were in charge, and the women who did all the shit work. And it was replicated at home in many ways. I knew I couldn't do that anymore, even if I wanted to. And there were times when I just, I just wished that I could have been a traditional woman. When I just wished that I could have gone home to cook and gone home to sort of do all the right things and sort of fit in with all the expectations. But it became quite clear that I couldn't. Where did these expectations and feelings of guilt come from? The ideal of the perfect self-sacrificing mother has seemed so essential to the happiness and well-being of everyone. But behind the family portraits lie institutions and belief systems that have dictated and maintained certain roles for women. In what ways have these impossible standards affected the true relationship between a mother and child? So we try to unravel the myths of perfection from our real experiences. 
But even now, when so much is supposed to have changed, there are prescriptions for good mothering, which have stayed almost the same. The paper written by Gordon Freeman, a chemistry professor at the University of Alberta, contends that many children brought up by working mothers become unethical adults. Freeman writes, my study indicates that the tendency to cheat correlates strongly with the absence of a full-time mother in the home. He goes on to say, we can now see evidence of psychological damage in about one out of two children of working mothers. Drug abuse, compulsive eating, cheating on exams, not telling the truth in controversial situations, and other behavior that society finds destabilizing. Regarding the parent best suited to staying at home, Freeman says, it seems the majority of women were equipped by nature to be nurturers, and most men were not. He based his study on informal conversations with his students. Well, I came to the conclusion by studying the behavior of, of a bunch of people <laughs> over a period of seven years. But I want to say at the beginning that this paper is, is not about feminism or women's groups or things like that. It's about society and what it takes to keep a, a, a society stable. Dr. Friedman has published an article which is an opinion piece and he tries to masquerade it as having some basis in reality and scientific research. There is nothing in this, uh, in this article to back up his opinions. Uh, it is not true that children of double income families demonstrate any higher degree of any sort of social problems or miscreants than other people in society. What kind of an impact does this have on the science community? Well, I suspect it has no inc impact whatsoever on the science community. The worry is that because it's been published in a scholarly journal, despite the retraction and apology, that some people will continue to take it seriously. Unfortunately, it has received wide circulation because people are using it for lobbying purposes. I remembered Helen's words. Theories about mothering are never an accident. I treasure the love and connection I share with my children. I also treasure being able to escape from time to time. What does it mean to be a good mother? I wanted to speak to women of my own generation about love and identity, about the mixed messages and competing desires of motherhood today. I followed Queenie Hum as she rushed from work to school to home. Her story began with memories of growing up in Hong Kong in the 1960s. There is a famous saying of the three obediences for the Chinese woman. When you are young, when you are a daughter of somebody, you are supposed to obey your father. When you get married, you are supposed to obey your husband. And when you become old, you are supposed to obey your son. So, you know, operating from that kind of uh, uh, parameter, you know, uh, your status as a woman in the house and in the society is really uh, minimized, you know. Um, you are not asked even to ask for certain identity of your own. You are always referred as somebody's daughter, somebody's wife, or the mother of somebody. So, who is that woman? I was uh, originally from Hong Kong. I was raised in a family with both parents working as professionals. My mother always teach me like uh, certain things very cultural, like um, marriage is part of the life. You know, it's part of the normal life cycle. You have children. It's important to have boys, you know. On the other hand, she's also saying that economic equity, economic independence is very important in a woman's life. Don't ever let that go out of your sight because that will mean uh, 
uh, power. I remember each year on uh, March the 8th, my mother would come to me and say, today is March the 8th, International Women's Day. Just you and me, because we have only two females in the household, is that I'm just taking you out for this special day. This was my first encounter with something specially for women. Queenie is married with two children and works full time. Because her husband works out of town one week a month, she is often solely responsible for her children's daily routine. Social worker and community organizer, Queenie is also a school board official. Like thousands of other women, due to economic reasons, Chinese women are required to work in one job where they are employed and another job at home. While the majority of sino quebecois women are still concentrated in low status, labor-intensive, dead-end job ghettos, performing multiple roles in the family after work create tremendous stress detrimental to their physical and mental health. sino quebecois families are going through a silent and unprepared economic and cultural transformation. Yet this necessity for change has not been accompanied by other supportive system or networks inside and outside of the home. They are the ones to absorb all the extra burden by playing the role of a superwoman. The superwoman in reality is a myth that is mastered up in a belief that if woman is efficient, if woman is organized, and if that woman is competent, things would work out. I met my husband in Canada, and now we, we have been married for over 10 years. I have a son who is nine years old, and a daughter who is going to be eight next month. Very soon after I got married, I felt that um, I knew that um, my cooking wasn't up to the standard of my husband's or their families, because I really don't know how to cook. And I understand my husband has certain expectation of that. I'm willing to learn, you know, but I need time and also patience on his part too, I guess. At the same time, I'm telling you there's certain, you know, level that I can achieve and beyond that, this is not a priority in my life. But then when my son was born, then I realized how unprepared I was in the whole thing of motherhood. I don't even know how to hold a baby. I have to learn that stuff from scratch, so it's very demanding. I stay home for five months, and then the urge is so strong that I said uh, I have to go back to, uh, to the workforce. I feel a part of me is so unfulfilled, and I can't see myself staying home longer. I talked to my husband about that. This is what happened. He said, well, this is the decision that you have made, that um, you decided to go back to work, and the most available alternative and the best that uh, he would settle for is daycare. I put him in daycare, an experience that I found myself terribly guilty of because he was crying and in the first week, the baby lost his voice. I was keeping asking myself, what kind of mother are you? How can you let a child who is only five months old so helpless uh, to go through the experience? Um, you know, what happened to you? Are you a very selfish person? Um, but and on the other part of me, I said that this is adjustment, you know. The book said this, you know. My doctor said this, you know. The pediatrician said that it's, a, it's just a transitional period, you know. You have to be strong to go through that. So I went through that. I mean, I was crying. When I picked him up from, uh, from the daycare, I was driving him home, you know, I, I was crying in the car, you know. You want it? You like it? The one that I gave you today? Yeah. I did not go to anyone for support. I tried to sort it out myself. I absorbed it and, you know. And then I have my second one even more unprepared because they were only 14 months apart. So when the two are so young, you have to change diapers at the same time. 
to feed them both at the same time, so it was tiring. And I felt at a certain point, I lost myself. The feeling of losing oneself came up frequently in my conversations with mothers of young children. Yet for some, motherhood was also seen as a first step towards self-knowledge. This was especially true for Carole Lacroix. J'ai été élevée à côte saint paul dans une famille nombreuse. On était dix enfants, six filles, quatre garçons. J'ai des parents qui nous ont arraché beaucoup aussi. Puis, euh, je peux pas dire que j'ai pas, j'ai pas été bien élevée, là. Au contraire, et ils ont tout fait leur possible pour nous aider. C'était que... Aujourd'hui, j'ai conscience que j'ai manqué un peu d'amour, euh, mais je le reproche pas à mes parents. Dans ce temps-là, la façon dont ils ont été élevés eux autres, ils nous élevaient à cette façon-là aussi. Tout était pas mal strict, puis euh, c'était pas, il y avait pas une grande ouverture, je trouve, euh, face au, au questionnement des enfants, face à l'amour donné aux enfants aussi. J'ai quitté l'école, j'avais environ 14-15 ans. Puis euh, si je l'ai quitté, c'est à cause des petits garçons. C'est important pour moi que j'aie des amis, qu'on m'aime. C'était tout le temps comme ça, qu'elle s'essaye pour fumer, qu'elle s'essaye pour faire l'amour euh, ou quoi que ce soit. C'était, Ça m'a suivi pendant des années, de, de peur de déplaire aux gens, aux autres. Je me disais, si je leur déplais, si je n'ai pas la même opinion qu'eux autres, ils ne m'aimeront pas. Je vivais dans un monde irréel. Le monde de la drogue, euh, des gangs, là, euh, toutes sortes de choses qui se passaient, qui ne pouvaient pas me permettre d'évoluer là-dedans. C'était impossible. Puis quand j'ai décidé d'avoir Cristal, ben, ça n'a pas été un accident non plus. Là. Je l'ai fait par amour aussi, parce que euh, à ce moment-là, euh, j'aimais bien cet homme-là aussi. Là. Puis euh, c'était que je me disais j'avais assez vécu. Puis pour moi, vivre c'est assez vécu, c'était que j'avais assez courroyé les brasseries, les clubs, puis euh, les gangs, c'était ça. Mais de, de là à faire un vide, un vide complètement, euh, c'était pas encore dans mes projets. Simplement, je voulais avoir un enfant. C'est L'amour que je manquais à ce moment-là, je me disais que mon enfant me le donnerait, puis que je donnais. Aussitôt que j'ai eu Cristal, j'ai pitché tout mon dévolu sur elle. Là, il n'y était plus question de cet homme-là dans ma vie parce que je ne voulais pas qu'elle vive que ce que je vivais, moi. À, à ce moment-là, j'ai commencé à évoluer. J'ai changé complètement. Je me retrouvais toute seule pour la première fois en logement, puis toute seule avec un enfant en plus. Que C'était une époque assez dure, là. Il fallait que j'y aille, que je marche assez loin. Ça me prenait un heure à deux heures marcher, aller voir des amis pour emprunter de l'argent parce que je recevais un chèque de bien-être. À ce moment-là, je, je voyais ça plus comme euh, oh, je fais pitié. Aujourd'hui, je ne le vois pas comme ça. Je me dis, euh, je me considère très chanceuse d'avoir pu vivre une relation toute seule avec mon enfant. 
De la première année de Cristal jusqu'à un an, j'étais toute seule avec elle. Puis après, bon, j'ai eu une autre relation là, avec euh, un homme que je pensais différent. Mais euh, pff, la violence que j'avais, que je vivais avec lui. Et, puis pourtant, ça s'est fait quasiment de, de, au début des trois premiers mois qu'a commencé la violence. Tu sais. Mais euh, je le voyais pas. Je me le cachais peut-être parce que je, je rêvais trop d'avoir ma, ma petite famille. Je me l'ai caché pendant trop longtemps. J'étais là, j'étais tout le temps avec elle. J'y donnais de l'amour, mais face à la violence que je vivais, je devenais agressive quand j'étais toute seule avec elle. Donc, elle percevait tous mes signes à moi de, de violence que moi, à ce moment-là, je voyais pas. Mais elle, elle les percevait en tant qu'enfant. Donc, elle, elle devenait l'image que moi, j'étais. Le monde la trouvait même détestable parce qu'elle pouvait arriver et euh, te fesser dans le visage, te donner des coups de pied. Euh, elle était vraiment là, quasiment insupportable. À cause de mon agressivité, là, puis à un moment donné, euh, je criais. Bon, je, je pensais que j'étais en train de devenir folle. Tout. Puis euh, à un moment donné, une de ces journées-là, ben, je l'ai vue d'un petit coin là, qui se protégeait, qu'elle avait peur de moi. Puis euh, c'est à ce moment-là que tout a déclenché, que elle, je voulais pas, que je m'étais aperçue que moi, j'aurais pu devenir violente, vu que j'étais violentée. J'ai eu assez peur de ce moment-là et je voulais pas y toucher. C'était euh, la chose la plus horrible que j'aurais faite. C'est à ce moment-là que ça a déclenché, là, vraiment. Là, euh, non, je veux pas te faire ça, tu sais, je peux pas y faire ça. C'est là que je m'étais aperçue qu'il fallait, fallait que je fasse de quoi, que je prenne des ressources à quatre parts pour m'en sortir. Over the next four years, Carole did everything she could to seek out free counseling and find help for herself and her daughter. What does it take for women to write their own prescriptions for good mothering? Yvonne Greer had thought a lot about her experiences as a single mother. A high school guidance counselor, Yvonne decided to have Kai on her own seven years ago. Whatever the reason is, there are many more single parents and children of single parents. And there's a prevailing attitude that sees them as deprived people who are going to end up in the streets, uh, on psychologists' couches, in jails, and so on. I find it very frightening. I think society is setting up our kids for, um, for doom. And of course, if a child is in trouble, uh, you say, well, he's a 12-year-old boy, and then, and then, and then, single mother. It makes me want to protect my son more They still portray the mother, the father, the two kids, or two and a half, one and a quarter, I don't know what it is. They still project that as the norm. So any person who doesn't fit in to that occasionally gets a pang. And of course, it makes me feel sometimes like, what am I, you know, am I missing something? Am I doing something wrong? What uh, role does Kai's father play now in his life? Lately, I've been trying to make an effort to bring them together, simply because one night when Kai was going to bed, he was crying. And I, I asked what was the matter, and he said, I miss my father. So I explained to him. I was honest. I said, well, you know, your dad and I are never going to live together. And you have to learn to live with that. But you can see him. If he doesn't ask you to come and see him, you call him when you want, and he does call him when he wants to. Call him and tell him, I want to be with you. When I first realized I was pregnant, I felt that it was now or never. Because I grew up as a child of a single parent, it was okay and I felt comfortable that I could do it. I could do it alone. And it wasn't a hard, nerve-wracking decision. I just said, well, yeah, now's the time. My mother was 
support. She doesn't live far from me. So in the mornings, I would get up and prepare, get myself ready, get Kai ready. And then we'd go off to her house. So if I had to stay at work late or something, I was very comfortable. He was with my mother. Yvonne brought me to the house she lived in with her mother, sister, and extended family when she first came to Canada. Born in Aruba, Yvonne was two years old when her mother took her and her sister to live with their grandmother on another island in the Caribbean. Yvonne's mother was soon on her way to Canada to seek out new experiences and opportunities for herself and her daughters. Half the kids may be in the village that my grandmother lived in were children of mothers who weren't there, or parents who weren't there. The, the parents had immigrated to England or to the United States or to Canada, and they left the kids with the grandmothers, the aunts, and whomever was there. Well, I had 24-hour mothering. I just didn't have it from my mother, my birth mother, if you will. I guess it was that sort of communal type caring that I had. When Yvonne was eight years old, she was reunited with her mother, then a factory worker in Montreal. I don't remember feeling like I was with a stranger or that we were ever separated. I remember walking up the stairs and, and you know, seeing my aunt through the stairs, um, ironing in the kitchen and, and loads of clothes hung up in a row, pants, shirts, all well ironed. Um, and thinking to myself, I, I was 10 years old at the time and I, I said with a lot of emphasis, not, not verbally, but in my mind, it, very, very clearly, I said to myself, I'll never do that. Even when I found myself in, in a situation where I was pregnant and I thought, well, it's late now, I, uh, and I never decided not to have a child. So at that point, I decided that I would. You had a good role model in your mother. Yes, I did, and I, I didn't think it would be hard, but it is. I think it's hard to always make decisions, uh, be the only person to make a decision and not be able to say to somebody, what do you think about this? Um, it's a lot of responsibility because it's a life. It's not just the guys with the hard hats going down into the mines that are workers. It's women who are absolutely essential workers in this society. And we need to call ourselves workers, to think of ourselves as workers, even though it's hard to hold on to. Sometimes women working at home feel that feminists have not really appreciated mother work, motherhood, and women who stay home because that's their chosen field of work. That's their career for whatever length of time. Um, but it seems to me that the women's movement, I mean, here I, I guess I'm getting defensive, 
But I think the women's movement has brought this all out into the open and has helped us to think about paid and unpaid work and money. Am I going to have a pension? You know, do I have my own money? Who controls the money? Who decides about child care? Who decides where we live? All those kinds of questions. And nothing is ever perfect. We're not perfect. Women's movement isn't perfect. And it's something that hopefully is evolving, but providing us with some different ways of looking at the world and different ways of looking at the family and our own lives. After Helen's four-month stay in the psychiatric hospital, she refused to go home until some changes were made within her family. I couldn't go back to pretending that my own existence didn't matter. And I needed a support system for myself at this stage of the game, and I knew it. And if I didn't have it in the family, I don't know what would have happened to me. But I just knew that I wasn't going to provide it anymore. Period. And with Gil, it was a question of whether we would survive together. But I really need to say that he did take those areas over in a very serious way. He has, since 1973, done all the cooking, done all the shopping, been the primary parent when that seemed important and I needed him to play that role. And Goodbye. the social Goodbye. secretary lots of times. See you Monday. All right. And I guess the other thing that happened because I was very much involved with the women's movement prior to the breakdown and afterwards was I began to um, have my own life apart from the family. I'd be the last person in the world to, in any way, minimize the importance of personal and interpersonal connections and closeness. All those things that are called loving. But at the same time, I think it really doesn't have a chance in hell of working if we as women try to do that via other people rather than via our own bodies, our own minds, our own emotions, our own talents, our own dreams. I just don't think it's possible. Very often I would have open discussion with my husband uh, saying, you know, uh, I can do this and that, can you help, you know. Uh, you know, sometimes he will help, sometimes he will also challenge, you know, why should he help. I sort of uh, give in quite a little bit too, you know, and, and try to establish a gradual pro process that you ask, starting from a little to more and more and more until you achieve your goal, so there is a strategy, you know. As ethnic minority woman, there's a lot of guilt feeling saying that we have failed our culture as a Chinese woman. That's something very big. I think that when we wait it out, the benefits are more far-reaching and more <laughs> worthwhile than the price we pay. The freedom, the freedom of thoughts, I think, which is the most important thing that you can liberate oneself from and also the freedom not to give it to own your own self, but also to the family members, to the society as a whole. Giving certain new options to our children, to the generation after. Careful, Kai. Watch where you're stepping so you don't step on the flowers. Mm. Yvonne this says that her easy. mother, Annette, always made mothering look easy. Yvonne does not remember missing a father in a daily active way. Yeah, 
She explained that for Kai, it was different. I know his father loves him, but in his own way, in his non-committal way, he does. But Kai knows he does. And he knows it's different from a lot of other father-son relationships. Um, but yeah, I worry about that. I worry about him being able to make commitments later on. But he talks a lot about being a man and being a father in particular. And I think all the things he's not getting, this is maybe his way of telling me because he says things like, when I'm a man, I'm going to do this for my son and I'm going to do that for my son. I'm going to buy my son what he wants. and. Little things that tells me he talks a lot about being a father, and I think that's his way of making up. So I think he'll try, but the only thing that worries me, he talks about being a father without talking about being married or being with somebody. And he does talk about being a father, and then sometimes say, well, maybe if the mother says, if their mother says, okay. so. It, I think it's separate in his mind. It hasn't come together. But I tell him that it, it is a good thing to have. I don't want him to think that this is the greatest thing on earth. It isn't. Okay. But if we don't care who will, I mean, it seems like there's only us most of the time. Well, it's a pretty standard comment. Who will care for the children? Well, I think there are many ways to care for children. And I think that men, in particular, have been allowed off the hook and have been allowed to remain adolescent in their lives and not take responsibility for the really important human endeavors that go on with kids and mates and people. You know, men are held up as sort of the responsible decision makers of this world whose lives have to be sort of respected and supported by everyone around them. I think many of these so-called men have never learned very much about taking responsibility for people. And what in the hell is more important than people anyway? And what's a tougher job? And not just in terms of the division of labor, because some men are really uh, learning with difficulty to divide the labor, to divide the child care, to divide the domestic work, to be at home when the kids are sick, etc. I think some of those things are happening in a beginning way. But there are many, many other levels that men have to do a lot of learning and growing about. I really hope Simon has a wonderful fifth birthday party. Those voices from the past are telling me that really good mothers make perfect parties. John is nice and relaxed, filming us again. John really tries to share the raising of our children and the caring for our home. But the negotiations are far from over. Like who will plan and prepare what we eat most nights, or really be there to make the fun or comfort the tears? Whose career comes first? Whose salary pays the bills? And who might lose their job altogether? Who really is responsible for the success of this party? Quand je suis arrivée au centre de formation pour femmes, je me mets pas. Malgré toutes les thérapies que j'avais suivies, là, j'étais encore bien jamais là-dessus. Puis j'étais à la découverte de moi-même, là, qu'est-ce que j'aimais, qu'est-ce que je voulais dans la vie. Euh, c'était ça mon, mon gros but, de, de, de tout corriger ça, puis euh, d'être plus autonome euh, face à la vie.
Avant la formation, euh, premièrement, je venais ici euh, surtout pour euh, ma confiance, m'enlever euh, la culpabilité. Mais je ne voyais pas le, le changement que ça aurait pu faire vis-à-vis euh, -vis, euh, ma fille. Je voyais, euh, moi, il fallait que je change, là. Mais aujourd'hui, par contre, après la formation, tout, je m'aperçois que tout ce que, que j'ai changé de moi, ça, ça l'a intégré sur ma fille. Euh, C'est-à-dire, euh, comme j'ai plus confiance en moi, je, je suis plus calme, je suis moins stressée, je, je suis plus sûre de moi, en fait. Puis ma fille est rendue comme moi. Carole is now back at school. I asked her what other women might take from her story. Ça serait justement de se faire confiance malgré tout ce qui peut leur arriver. De ne pas rester assis à se morfondre et dire « je fais donc pitié, ça c'est la plus grosse erreur qu'on peut faire ». Puis de ne pas se sentir victime dans rien. De ne pas écouter les autres, de s'écouter soi-même. Il y en a plein de ressources qui s'informent, qui osent y aller, d'accepter qu'ils sont comme ça. Puis de, après, tout va poursuivre le, le, leur cheminement. C'est ça. Simone loves to play grown-up in my fancy clothes. I wondered what happens to mothers when their children have all grown up. I went back to the mothers of the 1950s to finish their stories. Does it, honey? Florence and her daughter Tracy often reflect on how much their lives have changed over the years. I listen to their stories, from the 1960s Black Power Movement to Sunday football games on Florence's day off. And she used to get out there just like she was one of the male figures out there, cheering real heavy with her loud voice and um, running with the football while my brother's making a touchdown, whatnot. I used to be excited when he got it. I used to say, come on and make sure he gets to the end of the line. That they don't, you know, and I used to run and boy, when they hit that ball, I used to jump up just as fast. What happened during the 60s for me was coming to a very, very strong sense of identity of who I was. And it came to the Black Power Movement. I was a great follower or student or believer in Malcolm X. Because he explained things about role modeling, things in your home, things you had to do to represent who you are. And I think that's where my house changed a lot. Because I really, to tell you the truth, prior to that, I don't think I really had, like, things on my wall. You know, things like that that represent blacks. I bought a set of encyclopedias on black history, so they would read that. I would read them sections of it. So they knew who they were, very clear. And they felt good about it, because what I would show was the positive part of history, like the inventors, the scientists, because we're not all dancers and singers. I decided to go back to school in 1985. My kids were growing up then, and I was able to go back to school. The last year I finished in school was at grade seven. That was back in 1954. But my kids were very good at saying, go on back, ma, go back to school. Florence completed her degree in social work at McGill University and currently works in the field. Her expertise is in black and interracial families. When I go into homes and I go and I do black homes and I do home assessments, hey, I do the same thing. If they got kids, I start talking. What do you say? Well, I start talking to them about who they are. I ask them and they'll say who they are. And I'll say, well, what does that mean to you? And they'll say, and I say, well, let me tell you, it means more than that. And what I'll do is, I'm noted as the photocopy. <laughs> I'm noted for photocopying, so what I'll do is I photocopy the articles, because I got tons of material on it, and I bring it to them. It seems like all your life you've been sort of fighting the institutions, fighting the system. I you will die fighting the institutions. Please. And what happened to Nancy? When I last saw her, she was living with David, using whatever community services for the handicap she could find. She had now made arrangements to bring her eldest son, John, home from the Manitoba Institution 
where he had lived for 25 years. Despite every effort, she had not been able to improve his care there or find him a good group home in the community. Nancy's search for a good and affordable alternative for both sons continues. upstairs and get your things? Okay? <laughs> Let's go upstairs and get your things. Then we'll go to McDonald's for lunch. Okay? There we go. Okay. Let's go this way. Let's go. We're gonna go get your clothes. Come on. This hat works. Oh, that's better. Yes. There you go. Do you like that hat? Okay. There we go. A little faster. A little faster, John. Very nice. For the last several years, Helen and her daughters spend a special weekend at a hotel midway between their homes. I did the first one. No, oh, my turn. Next. My okay. turn. Go tell and Rody. Go tell and Rody. Now, for many years, I think we're good friends. And I think the fact that we struggled so hard has really, in the end, enriched our connection. I asked Helen how things might really change for women within the family. I'm not into cheap grace. I don't know whether you know that term. It's sort of the notion that you can do it uh, quickly or easily or you can do it without really addressing the atrocities and really addressing how so many women are destroyed and really addressing the profound injustices that there are in this society on the basis of gender as well as race and class and homophobia and stuff. So I'm not into cheap grace or Quick answers. I don't believe in them. I think change comes hard. Change comes hard individually. I know that in my own life. I know that in my own work. And I know that politically. But I, I guess I want to throw the gauntlet to men. I think it's time. It's not just a question of saying, well, it's the system. We have to change all the structures and systems and institutions, we do have to do that. That, for me, doesn't take away from what the individual has to work on and struggle towards. Okay? Oh, the, the potatoes yeah. are going to turn into pancakes. Yes. 
I can't remember when I first learned about my mother's past. When she was in her early 20s, she, her 12-year-old sister, and their mother were taken to Auschwitz, the concentration camp. Only my mother survived. I wonder what it was like for you raising children with, with no mother. What do, you, what do you remember about her? What I always remember my mother because she didn't die in a normal way. They, she was taken to the guest chambers. And all the time when I had small children, I sometimes envy people where they have mothers to help them. And always my children came home not to have any grandfathers or grandmother, their friends they had. And this was a pity too. It was just a miracle that I came here to this country. What does it mean to be a good mother? I'm still not sure. The only thing that seems certain is that the outside prescriptions are dangerous and that the blueprints don't exist. The true stories of mothers, spoken in public, are perhaps our only guide. Please. Please. <laughs> I'm funny. You are really funny. <laughs> but you are mad.